I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you updates from across Ukraine. We discuss Valery Zeluzhny's first remarks as Ukraine's ambassador to the United Kingdom, and we speak to author and researcher Hanna Jostikova on her work documenting the experiences of the people of Mariupol before the full-scale invasion. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. The first duty of my government is security and defence, to make clear our unshakable support of NATO and with our allies towards Ukraine. Keep stand strong. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Tuesday the 23rd of July, two years and 155 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our assistant comment editor Francis Durnley and senior foreign correspondent Roland Oliphant. I started by summarising the latest news from Ukraine. Let's start in Ukraine, where at least 36 people, including children, have been injured by Russian drone and missile strikes over the past day. Just to give you a sense of the vast extent of the attacks, Russia attacked Nikopol on the right bank of the Dnipro, injuring five people and also damaged buildings. Fifteen were injured across Donetsk in a number of attacks. One man was injured in Kupiansk after a Russian drone strike. Three more were injured across Kharkiv Oblast over the border. Seven people were hurt over the past day down in Kherson Oblast and four more in Mykolaiv. Other the regions, including Luhansk, Chernihiv and Sumy, were targeted, but there were no reported injuries. Ukraine's Air Force said that Ukrainian air defences shot down seven of the eight Shahid-type kamikaze drones launched overnight. On the front lines, there's been little movements, but a couple of things just to pick up on. This is according to the Institute for the Study of War, the uh, US-based think tank. According to them, Russian forces recently advanced northeast of Kharkiv city. This is amid the continued fighting north and northeast of the city. A geolocated footage published on the 22nd of July indicate that Russian forces recently marginally advanced within Vovchansk. That's the town in which there's been very, very heavy fighting over the past few months. There's some confusion and uncertainty over the settlement of Hliboke, again from, comes from the ISW. That's a settlement uh, north of Kharkiv city, a bit to the west of Vovchansk. Just to bring you into the into the confusion, one Ukrainian military observer, Mashovitz, said, stated that Russian forces only maintained control over the northern part of the settlement, although one Russian source claimed that Russian forces drove the Ukrainians out of that northern part of the settlement and regain control. Yet another source claimed that it is a contested grey zone. So this isn't off chance, this is slightly to the west and we'll bring you more updates on this when we have it. Down in Chasiv Yar, Russian forces continued offensive operations but did not make any confirmed advances. Although Russian mill bloggers do continue to claim that Russian forces have advanced in the Sevesky Donetsk Donbass Canal area north of Chasiv Yar. The Ukrainian general staff reported a relatively higher number of attacks in the area north and northeast of Chasiv Yar. And finally, Russian forces made significant tactical advances within New York. That's the settlement south of Turetsk that we've been reporting on for quite a few weeks now. According to the ISW, geolocated footage published on July the 22nd shows that Russian armed forces have advanced in southwestern New York, corroborating the Ukrainian general staff, who reported that Russian forces attacked near Turetsk and New York. Finally, inside Ukraine, soldiers near Pokrovsk have claimed to have shot down another Russian Su-25 attack jet. Apparently, the plane was shot down as it was attempting to fire on Ukrainian positions. It's just to put this on into perspective, the general staff of Ukraine's armed forces said earlier today that Russia has lost up to 362 planes since the beginning of the full-scale war. Let's go south then. Uh, Russia claims its forces downed 21 Ukrainian drones over occupied Crimea and the Black Sea earlier, although local telegram channels have reported explosions on the peninsula. The region's governor claimed the drones attacked a ferry ship at the port of Kavkaz in the Kerch Strait. That separates, of course, the peninsula from mainland Russia. Emergency services are on the scene. The fire is localised. There is no danger of it spreading. This is Governor Kondratiev on Telegram, who also wrote, Unfortunately, there are injured and killed among crew members and port employees. Did not provide details on the damage dealt to the vessel. Ukraine has not commented on the claims and they have not been independently verified. Finally, from me, an interesting article in Aviation Week and reporter Tony Osborne, who's written an article on Ukraine's battle against Russian drones. 
They report remarks from the most senior U.S. Air Force general in Europe, that's General James Hecker, commander of U.S. Air Forces in Europe uh, and commander of NATO's Allied Air Command. He said that Ukraine is transitioning to the, quote, correct side of the cost curve, end quote, in its ongoing battle to deal with Russia's one-way attack uncrewed aircraft systems. Quote, Ukraine is actually doing a pretty good job at dealing with the one-way attack drones. They have their backs up against the wall, so they need to develop. Hecker spoke about, and we've reported on this before through Joe Barnes, Ukraine's low-cost acoustic sensor array called Sky Fortress. This system employs over 9,000 sensors across the countryside to detect threats. Again, we'll go back to Hecker. He says, Their idea was to put a cell phone on a six-foot-tall pole and put a microphone next to it and listen for the one-way UAVs that come their way. They get very accurate information synthesized in a central computer and sent out to all the fire teams who have an iPad showing the route flight of these one-way UAVs coming in. I caught up with Joe Barnes just before coming on today who said, confirmed all of that, and he said, I've spoken to some of the guys that helped design it, and he said, it's genius. So that's interesting reporting from Aviation Week there. I think that brings us up to date with the military updates, uh, Roland and Francis. So Francis, can I go to you? What are the latest diplomatic and political movements? Well, thanks, David. Bear in mind, last week we were covering the assassination attempt on Trump. And now, only a week on, we're discussing Biden dropping out of the presidential race with only 100 days to go until the election. These are truly historic times. I know it's a bit of a cliche to say that. Perhaps, though, what we still interpret as chaos is merely our new common reality that we've yet to truly come to terms with. It may well be that this kind of instability is something we're going to have to live with for many, many years to come, perhaps even decades. The latest development, of course, in the American context, which has come as a surprise to many, is that Harris is set to be crowned as the Democratic presidential nominee without a contest. A large pool, of course, of those who were calling for Biden to go wanted there to be a choice, including... It is speculated Barack Obama, who did not endorse her in his statement on Sunday. But evidently, there has been a concerted effort by others to sew up the nomination quickly. It is leading to some disquiet today, with some saying that senior Democrats not only partook in a conspiracy, concealing the health of the president to the public and the world, but have now performed something of a coup by foisting a candidate upon the public who was decisively defeated when she ran for the presidential nomination prior to her being appointed the vice president. The Democrats are evidently relying on her changing the narrative from all of the speculation over President Biden's fitness for office, as well as bringing in what they hope to be a new coalition of voters to secure her and the Democrats the presidency. But will it work? It speaks to the chaos that Aaron Sorkin, the creator of The West Wing, wrote a highly commented upon essay for The New York Times over the weekend proposing that the Democrats should nominate former Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney, who I interviewed for the podcast back in September, in an attempt to unify the public and fend off a Trump victory. Madness or genius, one's for future historians to cogitate upon. For our purposes, it is her impact on the issue of Ukraine that matters. In short, she is said to be consistent with Biden's stance, strongly backing Ukraine's self-defence efforts against Russia. In June, of course, she met with Zelensky at the Swiss Peace Summit, saying in her opening remarks, quote, Russia's aggression is not only an attack on the lives and the freedom of people of Ukraine, it is an attack on global food security and energy supplies. She's also, of course, a great believer in NATO. At the Munich Security Conference back in February, she pledged ironclad US respect for Article 5. But will her perspective on Ukraine shift in the course of the election? It feels unlikely, but if she's elected president, then we could expect at the very least a continuation of the Biden position and perhaps an increase of support for Ukraine in an attempt to end the war quickly. So it is, of course, a very impactful moment, which is so it's why it's so vital that we continue to dwell on the US election. In the words of one Ukrainian MP who will be known to listeners, Kira Rudik, writing for us, Ukraine's very physical existence depends on the outcome in November. She is urging 
Kyiv to intensify efforts to speak with J.D. Vance and highlight why support for Ukraine is vital for the U.S. and globally. But turning to Ukraine specifically, Ukraine's top diplomat will visit China today at the invitation of Beijing for talks that Kyiv said would focus on how to end Russia's war and on a possible Chinese role in reaching a settlement. They said the main topic of discussion will be the searching for ways to stop Russia's aggression and to find a just peace. The Chinese have not fleshed out why Kuliber is there, but said that he would be there for three days. Of course, China didn't attend the Swiss summit and together with Brazil published that separate six point peace plan back in May, saying they supported an international peace conference being held that would be recognised by both sides in the war rather than just Ukraine or just Russia. I don't think that Kuliba's visit should be seen as a sign that Kyiv is moving closer to the Chinese position on negotiations, by the way, rather that it's doing the sensible thing in relaying its perspective to Beijing, knowing that they are, of course, a key broker. Now, in other diplomatic news, the ostracisation of Hungary's EU presidency continues with the EU's most senior diplomat, Joseph Borrell, calling a meeting of the bloc's foreign ministers in Brussels in an effort to boycott the rival gathering in Budapest. This is coming off the back, of course, as we discussed last week, the widespread anger over Hungary's rogue diplomacy, mainly conducted by Viktor Orban. Borrell announced that he had decided to convene this informal meeting of EU foreign affairs and defence ministers after the summer break, meaning that the same participants won't gather in Budapest as was originally planned. Again, no surprise here, given what we've reported, but nonetheless, not without impact. The EU is trying to signal its unity on the question of Ukraine. Yet even the idea of what support truly means, if you go beyond the idea of supporting Kyiv, is, of course, a very deep question. And there is fundamental division even among the supportive quadrants of nations about how far to go. And it's in that which I think we might expect to see further splits were the worst to happen. And Europe was obliged to support Ukraine on its own in the event of an American withdrawal or equivalent. Now, another country which has been seen in terms of leaning perhaps more, or at least its ruling party more, in the Moscow direction of late, will, of course, come as no surprise to listeners. That's Georgia, recently passing that controversial law. And now, we learn, reportedly placing 300 Georgian citizens who've served as volunteers in the Georgian Legion alongside Ukrainian forces on its own wanted list. So the Legion's commander told Russian language investigative outlet The Insider they didn't know what the alleged crimes the volunteers had been charged with. And yet the Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs charged over 70 volunteers of that Legion and put them on Russia's wanted list in October. So there's some insinuation that the Kremlin directly or indirectly might be playing a role there. And just lastly... As broke after the podcast went live on Friday, Evan Gaskovich, the Wall Street Journal reporter, has been sentenced to 16 years in a Russian penal colony after being convicted of spying in a behind-the-closed-doors trial that's been widely dismissed as a sham. The verdict was announced after three days of hearings, which is nothing. Western leaders condemn that as a despicable mockery of justice. Standing in the glass box, he crossed his arms and said nothing as the verdict verdict was given. Joe Biden afterwards angrily condemned the verdict, saying, as I have long said, and as the UN also concluded, there is no question that Russia is wrongfully detaining Evan. Journalism is not a crime. Now, for months, of course, there's been speculation the Kremlin wants to use the journalist for a prisoner swap, with Russia seeking the release of Vadim Krasikov, sorry, who is serving a life sentence in Germany. Putin hinted at negotiations back in March in that interview with Tucker Carlson. The president said the country would be willing to exchange the journalist for a patriot, which is widely understood to be Krasikov, who was jailed for the 2019 murder of a Chechenian separatist. Now, just for a little bit more context here, Mark Galliotti, of course, well-known expert on Russia, known to listeners on the podcast, as well as being an associate of the Royal United Services Institute here in London, said that the formal sentencing was, of course, a necessary stage in order for there to be any potential swap. So to quote him, it is looking... If looking for silver lining in his terrible case, given that the Russians will only do prisoner exchanges after 
conviction, the unholy speech in which he was tried and given this monstrous sentence means that whether or not an exchange deal is imminent, it at least means it is now possible. Now, Trump also, of course, has said that Putin will immediately return Guskovich to the US if he is re-elected. By making that pledge, Trump that is, it does mean that Putin has some leverage over a new Trump administration because he doesn't want to seem as if he has not been able to get this American he's promised to get back, back. So that may also be part of the calculation here. But that's where we are, David, in the political realm. Well, thank you very much, Francis. Good to have you back. Roland Oliphant, can I go to you? Yesterday, you saw Valery Zeluzhny make his first public remarks as ambassador to London. What did he say? What were your impressions? Uh, that's right. Valery Zeluzhny is, is finally in the country. You know what? I kind of remember exactly which month he was announced as coming as ambassador. But it's been, it's been weeks and a long time um, before he got here. So people have been waiting to, to see him appear in public. This was his first outing as an ambassador and appropriately enough it was a it was an environment in which you can imagine he would be comfortable the royal united service institute's uh, annual land warfare conference which is i mean it, it's a get together basically for british and allied army officers and defense think tankers to kind of exchange notes on the direction of the art of war so he was very much although he was wearing a, a blue suit he was dressed as a civilian he was there as an ambassador not a general interesting they chose to wheel him out in an environment in which he was definitely more comfortable, perhaps, than elsewhere. Um, he gave a speech. He he touched on the things you would expect a Ukrainian official to touch on. He he thanked Britain and other Western allies for, for standing with Ukraine. He said, you know, we do need more support, things like that. He reiterated, you know, that that message we've always heard from the Ukrainians that, you know, we are we're fighting for the whole free world. The implication being this is not charity that, that you'd be giving us. That this war threatens to expand, he said, is humanity ready for the next war on the scale of the First and the Second World War? Is this time the Third World War? Um, Western countries need to wake up, he said. And his, his wake-up call was actually quite specific. And getting to the meat of what he was talking about, he basically said, look, the current state of play on, on the battlefields in Ukraine is this. There has been a remarkable technological revolution which is driven above all by soldiers' desire to survive the battlefield. So it's a factor of, he said, not enough ammunition, not enough supplies, not being able to have the kind of conventional stuff that you'd hope to have. That drives innovation. And you've now got shifts in battlefield technology, which he didn't go into specifically, but he, he's basically talking about drones and, and the transparency that they've brought to the battlefield. He said, look, the, the situation is this. He said, these technologies are probably going to be decisive in this war. But neither Russia nor Ukraine is probably going to master them by themselves. So from our perspective, Ukraine has the experience um, and the battlefield application, but not the resources, not, not, not the opportunity to scale up and, and really pursue this research. And the West has got that. We better get together and get serious about working on that, working on this, you know, this new military technological revolution. Because if the democracies of the world don't win that race, the tyrannies of the world will, and whoever wins this race is basically going to dictate the global security situation in the future. So that was his basic thrust of his message. I must say, you know, that that's very similar to, to the remarks he was making when he was still commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. One of the points of disagreement between uh, him and President Zelensky, which led to him being fired in February, was this piece um, in The Economist where he, you know, he basically said that the, the battlefield is in a stalemate and it's going to be a technological revolution, new technologies that resolve it, akin to maybe the introduction of the tank in the First World War, maybe the introduction of gunpowder. So, yeah, that, that's the brief summary of what he said. Thank you, Roland. Did he give much of a sense of what it actually means to, as you said, the quote is, master these technologies? He said, for, for various reasons, neither Ukraine nor Russia will be able to master these technologies alone, but whoever masters them will decide the global security challenge. Did he talk much about what that means in practice, or did he imply anything? He he wasn't getting into specifics. Um, like I said, I mean, he kind of made a nod to drones, but he, he just talked about technologies without kind of saying, so this means that, and this means that. I think in the context of the conference, it's pretty clear. So, so before he was on stage, there was a discussion with a senior British Army general and, and, and kind of defense industry types talking about things like autonomous drones, 
drone warfare technology, the electronic warfare component of that, and how Britain, how the West can quickly enough adapt to these these rapid developments. That's what he's focusing on. Of course, at the beginning, I think Don mentioned this because he was he was listening to the conference yesterday. At the opening of the conference, Jack Watling of Rusi made made the observation that look, you know, how has you know modern warfare changed? Well, Ukraine shows us that the war in Ukraine shows us that it previously, when you would want to concentrate your forces to to achieve local battlefield superiority and that way defeat the enemy, now the person who's forced to concentrate is the person who's going to be uh, attrited more quickly. So that's kind of being reversed. So these are the kinds of challenges people are talking about, about the transparency on the battlefield, the way drones have made it very difficult for people to break cover, very difficult to mass troops for an attack and things like that. And it's a, it's a headache that everybody's kind of thinking of. He did also say, he said, look, uh, the war in Ukraine is not yet a future war, right? He, he cautioned against the idea that you're fighting a I don't know, a Star Wars war, a Warhammer 40,000 war or something. He said, you know, it's still, it's transitional, right? But this is going to be the blueprint for the wars that are fought in the future with this new revolutionary technology. Um, so artillery, infantry, all those traditional kind of skills uh, remain very important. But whatever these new technologies are, and, and again, he was a little bit evasive about defining specifically um, what they are, but I think we can extrapolate his meaning Whoever, whoever masters them will probably win this war and be able to set the, the global security climate going forward. Roland, it's really interesting hearing your perspective on, on his remarks. And of course, I read them in the paper and we'll add a link to them in the show notes. The central question about whether it's technology that holds the key to Ukrainian victory or whether it's mass, i.e., you know, the ability of getting ammunition, men, etc., to the right place. That has been a fault line discussion now for many, many months. And as you say, since Zeluzhny's essay in The Economist, which set it out in quite those stark terms. You've summarised there what Zeluzhny's perspective is, which seems to be broadly still more on the technological side as being the key. I'm interested in what your sense was more generally at the conference in terms of what people were suggesting needed to be done. Of course, this was a major event uh, in terms of given Zeluzhny's presence and indeed those who were invited to attend. So it's interesting interested to hear your perspective on the general mood music there and the topics of conversation and whether you do think things have moved on in terms of our understanding or whether we are still trying to answer the central problems that were posed with the failure of the counteroffensive about six months ago. I mean, I think, I think in general terms, it's, it's obvious to me that everybody who's in that kind of defense community, which I'm not really, right? But it seems like that this, this is something they're definitely grappling with. I mean, John Healy, the new defense secretary, was on stage after, after Mr. Zeluzhny, and he was asked by an army officer, how does the army kind of catalyze or play a role in speeding up this industrial kind of process? And Healy's answer is, look, you know, you're, you're, you're a senior army officer who's asking that question, and two or three years ago, we wouldn't have been doing that. So which could be slightly a politician's answer, but I think there's something to that, right? I mean, it's it, it's being grappled with. I think one of the issues is kind of the speed at which this happens, right? And one of the criticisms I've definitely seen of the West is this slight complacency, the, the sense that Western thinkers and, and army officers are looking at what's going on in Ukraine, thinking, oh, that's interesting, so on and so forth. But because of, you know, long procurement cycles, the amount of money you need to invest in things, you're not going to see that rapid organic kind of evolution right that you just see in battlefield warfare conditions and i suppose the the concern is that for that reason if eventually you know western militaries end up in a peer to peer conflict with uh, with the russians with the chinese with with whoever they will find that the russians for example have gone through this rapid evolution and we perhaps have not he also made a couple of other observations about the most the most important lesson from the war and, and he said look there were two things that, that he took away in broad terms from the war. He said the first absolute priority, the absolute biggest lesson of the war is how important being prepared is. You've got, got, got to be ready to fight. And it's not just about having your army ready, having the ammunition ready, having, having the equipment ready before it happens. It's also about having a, a kind of fully prepared society and his observation was that look, war is total. I mean, this war obviously is total. You know, it, it involves mobilizing all parts of the state and society, and, and society is going to have to accept some kind of temporary limitations on their, you know, routine, normal freedoms. Which I suppose 
if we're sitting in our armchairs kind of talking about, you know, as as we love to on this podcast, you know, you know, I find so, you know, the precedence of past wars, the Second World War or, or, or the Polio or whatever is, you know, I think, well of, well, of course that that happens, but it's that's actually quite difficult to imagine in a in our modern democratic societies. But but he seemed to be saying like that was one of the big key takeaway factors. You know, you have got to be ready. And I think he he seemed very anxious to kind of press that home to all those generals and colonels and and, and the secretaries of state in the room. After it's happened, it's too late. You've really got to think about being ready for it if it happens. Avoid it like crazy, but you've got to take preparation seriously. And finally, Ronan, for me, obviously, one of the sort of positive reasons that Zeluzhny was given this post is the potential political rivalry with Zelensky and his popularity within Ukraine. What did you make of him uh, as a civilian, as as a politician? Did, did did that come through at all, or did you did he seem confident? Did he speak well? What were your impressions? He seemed very cheerful. I mean, he looked fairly comfortable in his civilian suit. I mean, we're used to seeing him always in in you know kind of Ukrainian camouflage fatigues, but but there he was, kind of one of the only people in the room who wasn't in military uniform kind of playing the role. He, he cracked a joke about having never liked dealing with geopolitical questions as a soldier and kind of acknowledging, well, that's, that's pretty bad if you're a diplomat. Um, I suspect part of the reason that he was put on stage here, this is the first time he was wheeled out, and the fact that the speech was on the record, but the question answer session answers was not, is that this is an area which he is comfortable and confident speaking, um, but it, that maybe he's not that confident yet and is wary of you know putting his his foot in his mouth by saying something he oughtn't to because he isn't um, a diplomat i mean he will see i mean i can definitely understand um that kind of caution he certainly didn't say anything that i would i don't know maybe my my antenna is not that good i, I didn't interpret anything kind of critical of, of the government or of Zelensky. Uh, you know he, he began his address in english i'd say it was the english of someone who's you know been studying hard not especially confident, but he did it. And then he, you know, to deliver his speech, he switched to Ukrainian, which he was obviously much, much more comfortable. Normally, you'd expect a, an ambassador in in the London position from whatever country to be a to be a fluent English speaker. Um, he's obviously putting a lot of effort with it. We'll see. I think he's gonna he's gonna grow into the role. Thank you, Roland and Francis. Last week, I spoke to author and researcher Hannah Jostikova from the University of Glasgow about her research in Mariupol. Hannah visited many times before the full-scale invasion, speaking to activists on all sides of the political spectrum. We spoke about her time in the city, the differing perspectives of the people she spoke to, and the impact of the full-scale invasion on Mariupol and Donbass. Here's our conversation. Hannah, thank you so much for your time. Would you start just by introducing yourself, your research and your new book? Thank you, David. Uh, it's lovely to be on the show. So thank you very much for having me on. So I'm Hannah Justikova. I'm a political ethnographer. Recently finished um, a project uh, with the University of Glasgow about uh, motivations of foreign fighters to fight for Ukraine since the beginning of the war, 2014. And my research is broadly about mobilization in Ukraine. That is domestic and foreign. And I started looking at this as part of my PhD, so from 2016, and I'm looking at mobilization since the onset of the then Donbass war in 2014. So my PhD was on Mariupol and Luhansk, and it was a mobilization of locals since the start of the Maidan revolution, so since the end of 2013. And I was looking at what motivations of ordinary people like you and me who essentially overnight became political actors because of the changed political circumstances that Maidan brought. So I uh, found this very interesting and we can talk about it later. But the book I want to talk about today is about Mariupol and about Mariupol between 2013 and 22, about Mariupol between protests and war since the onset of the war and now into the full-scale invasion that saw uh, Mariupol uh, occupied and ultimately destroyed as we knew it. Hannah, do you remember the first time you saw Mariupol? Can you tell us about going into the city and just lay out for us the, the place you first started doing your work? What, what what kind of city was it? Who did you meet? So when I started my research, this is the beauty of ethnography. They don't really know what you're going to find, who you're going to meet, what tomorrow is going to bring. Actually, I when I was searching for 
my PhD topic because my motivation was mainly to try to understand the Donbass war from the perspective of the people inside because when you remember back in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, the world started to pay attention to Ukraine but for the reasons that Russia and the West found themselves in competition again. So there was a lot of talk about whether there is a new Cold War, what the the Russians want, what's going to happen in Ukraine. But there was not really much focus on what's happening inside of Ukraine. So that was my motivation to go. I didn't know the language at all. So I was looking for people to meet in Slovakia, where I'm from, and in the UK. And there were some volunteers here in Slovakia. And one of them told me that there was this amazing pro-Ukrainian mobilization in support of the Maidan in Mariupol. And I thought, Mariupol, but that's eastern Ukraine, that's Yanukovych uh, stronghold, that's the party of regions, oligarch supporting society. So I became very interested in this and basically set up a meeting with pro-Ukrainian volunteers in Mariupol and set off, found the, the interpreter who showed me the city and then arrived after 16 hours on the train in Mariupol. So the first thing I saw was like this factory smoke and the air was very heavy and I couldn't breathe. And then when I started to meet with people, I slowly started to realize that it's not just factories, it's also pro-Ukrainian cultural events, it's festivals. I started joining various educational and cultural events that volunteers organized and then I also started meeting ordinary people, teachers or museum workers who then started to talk about the other side of the mobilization so what life was like before the war under Yanukovych and then they started to open up about why they opposed to the Maidan revolution, why they thought that the Donbass would be better off closer tied with Russia than the European Union and for example even why they decided to vote in the illegal referendum for the independence of the region. So the more time I spent in Mariupol over the years and the more people I met up with again and again that kind of deepened the trust and because I'm a foreigner and a young woman that made my life so much easier because people opened up to me quite easy because I didn't have any political agenda. I said, I'm a researcher. I just want to know what the Donbass is about. Tell me your experience. So that is how I became the ethnographer accidentally. So you met people in Mariupol on both sides of the political divide, those who favoured uh, closer political ties with Russia, those who were sympathetic to the government in Kiev, all at the time of the Maidan uh, revolution. Could you just go into a bit more detail? Tell us about these people. What were their motivations? And also, when you were there, did you get a sense of the the sort of greater division of society? Were there a handful of people who were pro one side or the other and the majority thought one way? What was the division in terms of opinion? So when I started going to Mariupol, this was from 2018, so it was already uh, the war going on. So uh, people wouldn't be very public about their opinions unless they were really like pro-Ukrainians, unless they were organizing events uh, in support of the Ukrainian culture or language or so on. So people who would have been supportive of the anti-Maidan or the Russian Spring, the so-called Russian Spring, uh, they wouldn't be politically active uh, as much anymore, uh, mostly on the, the societal level, ordinary people. Uh, you would have to seek them out. But the book itself is, is mostly about five heroes. Three of them uh, would have been organizers of, of the Maidan and then supports of pro-Ukrainian Mariupol after the uh, Russian occupation of Crimea. Uh, and one of them was an organizer of, of the anti-Maidan who wasn't actually part of the party of regions. He was um, ideologically inclined to support the anti-Maidan. And the last hero is a Secret Services agent who helped me get the perspective of what it was like to actually be there because he would have been at every event and he knew everyone so he was my gatekeeper as well so he gave me contact on various people from both sides. So in terms of the pro-Maidan, pro-Ukrainian movements, 
they are quite straightforward. They were against Yanukovych. They were trying to resist the Donbass identity of people. They wanted change. They wanted a pro-Western, pro-European course of, of Ukrainian future. And uh, when it comes to ordinary people who supported anti-Maidan, it wasn't exactly a resistance to the changes that they saw that uh, Maidan would bring to the Donbass. So they, they were resisting these values and also any potential changes to the economic status quo, to the political status quo and the societal status quo as well. What did you find as an ethnographer looking at this to be the influence of the Russian state? I mean, we hear quite a lot of the infiltration, the little green men down in Crimea, of course, and of course the support for the rebel groups and from the Russian armed forces in, the, in those years. How did you see that playing out in the, in, in the civilian population? Well, uh, it was very subtle. I go in, into quite a lot of detail how the the works, the, the Russian works, actually worked on the ground. So you have people, when we talk about leaders of events, they were generally people who were very well known to the ordinary people. So they had the air about them, which was like, I'm one of, I'm one of you, I'm one of the ordinary people. And these leaders, they were mostly all of them tied to the Russian agencies, intelligence agencies in one way or another, because they were mostly financed by them. It wasn't very overt before the annexation of Crimea. It was very subtle, and in terms of anti-Maidan, that was supported by the oligarchs as well, because they wanted to preserve the status quo of, of their influence over the region as well. So after the annexation of Crimea, then we see an active support an active effort to, to destabilize Ukraine, which started with the annexation of Crimea, obviously, and then moved into the Donbass. This is known as the Russian Spring, so-called Russian Spring. And the thing is that the annexation of Crimea in the Donbass created an ideological boom. People started thinking we might have a chance to follow Crimea into the Russian world. So people became very excited about the prospect of joining Russia of maybe having autonomy for the region. There was a lot of narratives about the Donbass feeds the rest of Ukraine. We want to be separate. We want to govern ourselves. We want all the money to stay in the Donbass. And with political violence, this was exacerbated. So when we have the takeovers of buildings over the regions, the Donbass regions, starting with April, we see that the acting president, Turchinov, he launches an anti-terrorist operation. And uh, the population of Donbass, they take this very personally. And then they say, the president in Kiev, they're treating us as terrorists. We are not no terrorists. We just want the Donbass to be governed by our own. And this was like created this kind of necessary popular mass to be able to be exploited for the Russian services then to be used to destabilize Ukraine further. So the plan was kind of like destabilize Ukraine until the elections, uh, presidential elections that were set on the 25th of May. And then we see that with uh, the help of volunteer battalions and then the Ukrainian army beginning to be able to mobilize again, we see that this effort of the rebellion and separatists it was becoming weaker, and we see that the occupations of, of cities and towns, the grasp of the society was becoming weaker as well, and we see this, for example, in Mariupol, which became liberated in, in, in June. So there we have the sign that the insurgency was becoming weaker, and then they needed more support from the Russian Federation, and we see an, an increase of weapons and agents and regular army personnel as well. So to sum up where we are in the story that you're telling, you go to Mariupol and what you find is people who sympathise with lots of different opinions, some people who are much more sympathetic towards Kiev and to Ukraine, some people who are more sympathetic to this idea of the Russian world and the sort of special place that Donbass has in it. And then this tension rises and rises. And as I think you said, 
many of the leaders of the more pro-Russian side are, are actually linked in some ways to the Russian security services that are financed by that through those channels as well. And it breaks out into this overt violence, which again is underscored by support from, from the Russian state. Could, could you tell us a little bit more about the, the people that you speak to? I mean, in particular, I'm interested in, Mar- in Marichka, who's almost the most important person that you, you interview through these years. Can you tell us who she is, why you think she's important and what she means to you? So she was actually the person whom I travelled all the way to Mariupol to visit and to interview. And she was the person who decided the course of my PhD and, well, ultimately the book as well. So she's a lady in her late 30s, maybe early 40s, and she's a professor at the Mariupol State University. So she teaches history and politics. And she started Maidan movement in Mariupol because she was pushed by the students. They wanted to support Kiev Maidan and there wasn't a popular comparable Maidan in Mariupol because it was very marginal. It was actually dangerous because the party of regions grasp on society and politics was complete. So she spoke with the rector of the university and she told him, we want to have Maidan revolution. Well, not Maidan revolution, we want to have supportive protests uh, at the university as well. So he granted that and they were able to meet up and support the movement in that way. Then they travelled to Kiev as well, to Kiev Maidan. But she's kind of an accidental leader because she never expected that she would become any kind of political actor. But then with the annexation of Crimea, everything changed because she was one of the first people who said Crimea is the first and Mariupol can be the second. It's because people and volunteers like her, they understood back then in 2014 that Russia will not stop, that Russia will ultimately invade Mariupol, that Russia will try to connect the Russian territory with Crimea and create a land bridge, and they started getting ready. And this was already in March and April 2014. And we see more and more pro-Russian and Russian actors appearing. In February, March, we see a lot of Russian cars on the streets. We see these titushki, Russian-paid, usually workers or unemployed or former prisoners or alcoholics. And they support the anti-Maidan movement. So we see a lot of people coming into Mariupol to try to tackle or crush any forms of resistance. So Marichka and other volunteers, they see what is happening and they know very, very well the state of the Ukrainian army, that the army is in the west of Ukraine because historically Ukrainians during the Cold War, they did not perceive Russia to be a threat. So the threat would have come from the west. So the army was demobilized for various reasons. And ultimately what that meant for the Donbass generally was that the volunteers had to protect themselves. So they started to form territorial defence, like self-defence groups. They started to equip themselves. They started to network like-minded individuals who would have met up during the Maidan. So they knew each other and started cooperating. And then with April and with the soldiers arriving in the Donbass, they started seeking them out. And this is where the mobilization became more like a fight in any way you can. So you have, for example, grannies who would refuse to become part of Russia in any way. They started feeding the soldiers. They started giving them things to wear because sometimes the soldiers would have been dressed in slippers. They wouldn't even have proper uniforms. So some of the volunteers had some Second World War armour <laughs> at home, helmets and uniforms, and they, they would be bringing it to, to the soldiers. So this became like an underground secret movement and networking under this whole Russian Spring movement. So Marichka herself then accidentally became a leader of this organisation called Novi Mariupol, which was a volunteer organization, that kind of an umbrella organization for supporting the army in any way, literally. And she became an organizer of territorial defense formations as well. And then they started cooperating with the army. So she became an important figure for 
Ukrainian self-defense and protection of the city as well. Hannah, could you bring us up to date then? You did this ethnography or this research, obviously in the years preceding the full-scale invasion. What do you know happened to the people you're speaking to and how did society change? I mean, again, you're describing a society which sounds relatively divided between different political goals and identities. What did the full-scale invasion change about that? When you go back to your to the people you talk to now, what do they say? Yeah, so physically I visited Mariupol in 2021. Obviously I didn't know it was the last time I would meet the people, see the place. And it changed into this quite cosmopolitan city. You had festivals, NGOs supporting Ukrainian culture for the first time ever with the war we see this growth of pro-Ukrainian civil society and it was very very visible in the city even though people told me that it was still 50-50 in percentage of who supported Ukraine who supported their idea of Russia or their idea of, of the region what it should be or who it should be aligned with uh, there were visible changes to nurturing of Ukrainian culture and symbolism and this was also visible in the use of language. For the first time we see, well, I heard on, on the streets, uh, Ukrainian language. Compared to 2018, that was very, very new. So uh, the, the society in the shadow of the war changed quite a lot with these individuals nurturing uh, this kind of Ukrainianness in them. And obviously in February 2022, when I heard of the invasion, Actually, two days before, there was a huge gathering in Mariupol. Yeah, and this, this movement was organized uh, by, by the people I knew, by the people who would have attended the Maidan movement. And it was uh, a meeting or like a demonstration for free Mariupol because Marichka used to say that a city that defends itself will never be occupied or destroyed. So that was the main motto of, of the meeting. Obviously, two days later, the full-scale invasion happened. Uh, within a week, uh, Mariupol was uh, attacked from the air, the sea, the ground, and ultimately became occupied. And so these people who started the pro-Ukraine movement in 2014 were the people uh, at the heart of the Mariupol resistance in 2022. So many of them would have been fighting for Mariupol. I don't want to say too much about how this all transpired, because it's a conclusion in the book that I, I would like the reader to enjoy. But Marichka, for example, she fled Mariupol when it was still safe, but she still continues to support the army. Uh, she remained in, in service. And the pro-Ukrainian supporters remained supporters of Ukraine. And the anti maidan organizer, who he always told me that he didn't want Mariupol to become part of Russia, he actually returned to occupied Mariupol and lives there. So it's quite telling. And I'm very glad that I was able to follow uh, the fate of my respondents into 2022 because uh, it concludes the story of Mariupol and concludes the ethnography of the place as well. And in terms of people who stayed in Mariupol, it's difficult to label because some people really have nowhere else to go when it comes to, for example, pensioners. I tried to comprehend the rationale of staying in a war zone. When I was in the Donbass in 2022, I was engaged in evacuations of civilians. I was in Soledad when it was disputed, when it was partly occupied by Russia, when no one else would try to get the civilians out because it was too dangerous. So volunteers did that. And when I asked the people who refused to be evacuated, why do you stay? Some of them told me, this is where I was born, this is where I'll die. Some people said, I'm not needed. Where will I go? What will I do? All I have is my flat, my possessions. I'm not ready to give it up. And even as long as they had a place to stay, even if it was the basement, some of them would stay and hope for the best. What if the war ends tomorrow? What if something happens? They try to rationalise these things differently. But most people, I would say almost 100% of people who were pro-Ukrainian would probably have done their best to leave. But some people, you know, they had their parents there. It was difficult to, to make that decision because they knew, I think, perfectly well that they might never come back. 
Hannah, looking back over your work, what do you think, in the popular understanding, are the sort of biggest myths or misunderstandings about Mariupol? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm concluding the book with, we will need more research about how the region changed in the shadow of war. Uh, because now we have full-scale invasion by the Russian Federation. In 2014, it was an invasion, but it was part of a hybrid warfare. So it was um, a very different situation back then. But I guess that the biggest uh, misunderstanding we have about Donbass is that it's just 100% pro-Russian, that everyone wanted to be part of Russia, whereby many people had many ideals, many aspirations, and they wanted different things. I mean, in 2014, it is very safe to say, I believe, that in terms of the local population, no one ever wanted a war. But unfortunately, Donbass is a region where this kind of war is possible because of the underlying reasons that make Russian influence possible and Russian meddling possible as well. So that's why I started doing the research to begin with, to explore what the Donbass is, what it is not, and what are the varieties of identities and opinions and beliefs that these people have when they chose to support the Maidan or the anti-Maidan side of contention. Was there anything surprising, just to finish off, was there anything surprising or unexpected that you learnt about Donbass or about Mariupol that you didn't expect? It was when I come back to Marichka and all the pro-Ukraine volunteers, they were so adamant that, that Russia would invade, ultimately. It was almost impossible for me to comprehend or expect this full-scale invasion. But these people were mobilising in 2014, they were getting ready, and they knew that this moment would happen. And when it happened, they were ready. But unfortunately, the Russian army was stronger. But they knew what they were doing. They were prepared for the defence of Mariupol. And they did not flee. They fought until the end. Hannah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Let's move then to our final thoughts. Francis, would you like to go first? Well, the only thing I wanted to add really is how interesting it is to reflect, of course, on that central problem posed by Zeluzhny in his essay and for us to be thinking too here in this country and indeed in the wider West about the ramifications of the war and our own preparedness, as Roland was saying. At the moment, of course, there is a debate that's taking place here, as we've reported on the podcast, about whether Britain should be arming and whether it should be looking to develop certain technologies ASAP or whether it needs to spend a few months to do a proper strategic review that learns the lessons from Ukraine and then seeks to enact them. And you'll get people on both sides of the debate, as it were, who will say very strongly that their one is the right one. You'll get the people who will say we have no time, saying that we just need to do something quick and now. And you'll get those who are saying if we do that, we will be investing in the wrong decisions. So I don't have an answer. I imagine that there'll be many listeners who have a perspective on that. But nonetheless, both have major, major consequences. Because if the worst were to happen and we were to end up in a much more hostile environment in the defence sense in Europe in the next, say, six months to a year, then any delay could be absolutely critical to Britain and other countries' ability to be able to be proactive. And yet, if there is more time, then in a few years' time, if a decision was made that we act now fast... And then if we'd thought slower, we could have done better for that situation than people would say, we made a mistake now. So it's a really, really difficult one. And it's not just a British problem. It's a problem that is faced by many European forces at the moment. And I suppose you could say the frustration is that perhaps those discussions about the lessons from Ukraine should have been happening six months ago so that now we would be in a better position to be thinking in terms of preparedness and what decisions to be taken rather than it potentially being the right time or very much the wrong time. So an interesting conundrum, I think, that was posed as Lesney six months ago and which in many ways has still 
not been fully grappled with in Western powers at the moment. Well, thank you very much, Francis Donnelly. Roland, would you like the very final thoughts today? Uh, that's very kind of you, David. Um, uh, yeah, move, moving away from the politics, I'll be looking at, um, hopefully, the next couple of days, I, I don't want to be too flippant about this, but a kind of half-time report on the progress of the Russian summer offensive, really. And I think the the headline, not that the journalist ever writes the headline, I'll let you into that secret. It seems, at this moment, not, not wanting to tempt fate or anything, that the worst has been averted from the Ukrainian point of view. The, the Russians may have missed that opportunity they had early on to create a strategic breakthrough, to impose a collapse of the line, and that there are reasons, uh, various reasons, for you know, kind of pro-Ukrainian observers to to start feeling a little bit more optimistic. That said, you know, it remains a dangerous moment for Ukraine. The Russians are making progress, as you mentioned at the beginning, David. You know, they're they're making progress in New York. And they're making incremental progress up and down the front, and and all of that adds up. To a, well, where are we now? Well, we're mid July, so I'd say you know at least at least two months really of fighting before the um, before the weather starts to turn. Probably more than that, and then there's going to be the big question uh, looming over us all of the state of Ukraine's energy infrastructure, which I think is going to be a major issue going forward. But those are the things I'm going to be looking at in the next couple of days. So um, if you don't mind, you can well if you'd like to, you can look out for that piece in the paper when it appears. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear 